Welcome to this episode of Crossroad Connection. My name is Art Van Waldy, and I have the privilege today of having Ronald Simpson Bay with us. And Ronald is with an organization called Just Leadership USA. And we're going to have an interesting time talking with him about what this organization is and what it's trying to do. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about um, one of the things that is in the mission statement of this organization. But before we get to that, we're going to uh, have Ronald introduce himself. And so, Ronald, welcome. And why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, first, let me say thank you for inviting me. It is truly a pleasure, an honor, and a blessing to be here to sit on the stage and share the stage with you. And I appreciate the comfort of creating the space for us to have this discussion. As you said, my name is Ronald Simpson Bay. I am um, a member of an organization called Just Leadership USA. I come from a pretty diverse background. As we were talking earlier, I had spent 27 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections for uh, assault with intent to com commit murder conviction. However, my conviction was reversed by the federal courts and I was subsequently released. Mm -hmm. I went to prison in 1985. I got out in 2012. And my journey has been long, arduous, but it's been exciting. I mean, spending 27 years in prison, I mean, you can never get that back. Mm -hmm. So I set up trying to recoup the time, I try to redeem the time, and I'm redeeming it through my work, my ministry that I do now through Just Leadership USA and through American Friends Service Committee. And one of the things that, that really inspires me is this whole concept of restorative justice. Hmm. You know, restorative justice is a very interesting concept where you know, traditional restorative justice is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship between the victim and the, the perpetrator, so to speak. But through the work that I do, we've expanded the definition of uh, a victim to include the community as a secondary victim. Mm -hmm. Because the community suffers from uh, the harms of crime as much as anyone. So we seek to empower the community to help determine what type of person returns to our mm -hmm. community from prison. And that's a, that's a very, very powerful statement. And also, while I was in prison, uh, I had been in prison about 16 or 17 years. On Father's Day 2001, my only son, who was 21 years old at the time, was shot and killed by a 14-year-old juvenile in Flint, Michigan. And I advocated for the juvenile to be treated as a juvenile and not as an adult because I felt that it served no useful purpose to sentence this young child as an adult to life in prison and not give him a second chance. You know, we know that ch children's brains are not fully developed, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, I believe in second chance and redemption. So. I want for myself what I would want for someone else. And I'm just here to hopefully shed some light on some of these subjects for you. Well, great. Um, tell us a bit about Just Leadership USA. What, what is this organization? Just Leadership is, a, is an organization founded by a gentleman named Glenn E. Martin. Glenn had this vision where he thought that those are most closest to the problem are closer to the solution. In other words, those who have been harmed by doing time being in prison should be the ones at the table having these discussions and leading discussions on the reduction of the prison population in mm -hmm. the country. I mean, to have a discussion on decarceration, which is ending mass incarceration, without having a for formerly incarcerated at the table is like having a discussion on uh, women's contraceptives rights without having women at the table. Correct. So we, we seek to have the form voices of the formerly incarcerated represented at all levels of this discussion on in the prison population. Well, it's interesting to me. Um, we were talking beforehand about uh, a statement that's in the mission statement. Mm -hmm. And um, the mission statement says, Just Leadership USA is dedicated to cutting the U.S. correctional population in half by 2030. That is a gutsy statement. Absolutely. And it's a statement that I really like. Thank you. That's 15 years from now. Yes. To have our prison population reduced, that's, that, that's, that's amazing by half. Um, and we were talking, our prison population is 2.3 million in the United States. Yes, sir. Um, talk about that statement. What, what, what led to that uh, mission statement and how are you getting about that? Well, we, we're getting about it by sh shining light on programs that help that would help in, that reduce the recidivism, reduce the prison population. We seek to, like the one, one target area we want to go after is the elderly prisoners. 
I mean, when the last time you saw somebody in a 75, a 75 year old guy with a cane, you know, committing a whole bunch of crimes, mm -hmm. a crime spree. Now, our elderly prison population is just off the charts, so we want to reduce the elderly prison population. Another area of the population we seek to, to address is those who have served over 20 years already. They have grown out of the, the cycle of crime, criminal element of crime mm -hmm. for the most part. And if you go to any prison in the United States, the warden would tell you the guys that have served the long sentences, lifers and people have served over 20 years, the best behaved segment of the population, the best behaved, yet they receive the least amount of consideration. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with this picture? You know, I, I, I like the term, or what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. So if you continue to release those who have two or three years, you know, quote unquote, nonviolent drug mm -hmm. offenders back to the community and expect a different result, that's insane. You should look at those who have a track record mm -hmm. of doing a long time, haven't had any misconduct, they have matured, they've grown into responsible adults and deserve a second chance. I agree, but you know, you and I both know that we live in a society today that um, the politicians Mm. And the people of our community, they believe that we have to be tough on crime, uh, toss the key away. Um, we, we hear those things all the time. In fact, I was with family last night having dinner, mm -hmm. and this discussion came up because there was someone in the community that had been released from prison and committed a crime. And the response of one of my siblings was, well, you have to make sure you keep people incarcerated <laughs> for a longer time. <laughs> and I challenged my sibling about this, mm -hmm. that this isn't the way to do it. Um, but our society, it seems as if they want to be tough on crime, throw the key away, increase sentences. Uh, we're going into an election cycle where uh, many politicians will say, I'll be tough on crime. Right. How, do you, how do you deal with that? That's hard to deal with because it's, it's been going on for so long, but... Fortunately, we're on the back end. It, I call it the pendulum effect. When we started this cycle of being tough on crime back in the 80s or late 70s, early 80s, but now we're seeing the result of that. It, it doesn't work. It, I mean, it just absolutely does not work. The politicians recognize, they may say they want to be tough on crime, but they're actually looking for ways to reduce the prison population as well. I mean, and one of the reasons we have this, this real, this, this desire to be punitive in punishment is we've taken the humanity out of being human. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten that hurt people hurt people. We don't, we don't seek to heal the harms of people that have been hurt. We just seek to punish and punish and punish. And there's no, I mean, you get to a point of diminished returns. Mm -hmm. You can't punish indefinitely. You have, at some point, you have to look at healing the person and healing our communities. If you don't heal the, the person or the people return to our communities, our communities will never be whole again. Ronald, well, let's talk a bit about um, just leadership and its desire to re rehabilitate uh, the person that's incarcerated. What, what is just leadership doing to rehabilitate prisoners? Just leadership supports programs that, that seeks to rehabilitate prisoners. See, one thing, we know we, our goal is to reduce the prison population in half. However, you know, if we don't do anything or if nothing is done to prepare them for their freedom, the yeah, majority of them will probably just come back to prison. And that's kind of, that's been a statistical fact. And I always uh, compare it to the time when the slaves were freed after the Emancipation Proclamation. After the euphoria of freedom war, they hadn't been prepared for freedom. Mm -hmm. Most of them walked right back to the plantations. And I can see the same thing happening now if we don't prepare our prison population for uh, freedom. Because freedom, I mean, being free is difficult. I mean, no one, I mean, it's not gonna, nobody's going to take care of you indefinitely, so at some point you have to be ready to take care of yourself. You need education, you need employment, and until you get those things, once on the outside, you have to have patience. And if we don't teach them empathy, patience, self-responsibility, self-reflection, mm -hmm. the things that make them good citizens, then they would return. However, we seek to support programs that teach the prisoners these things, to teach the incarcerated people how to be good citizens, how to be good neighbors. And we think that'll go a long way in keeping the recidivism rate down while reducing the prison population at the same time. Why don't you talk to us a bit about your own personal story there? What, what helped you when you were incarcerated? <clears throat> what helped you in your, in your journey uh, for rehabilitation? Was there something that was really, um, that was effective and meaningful to your life? Re I mean, it's got started with reading for me. I had been in prison about maybe five years, and 
a friend of mine sent me a book called Visions for Black Men by a guy named Dr. Naeem Akbar. Mm -hmm. And it talks about self-responsibility and things we as black men need to do and mm -hmm. to our community. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it lit the social justice spark within me. It lit the social conscience spark within me. Mm -hmm. Because now I understood that I, I just had a, had a responsibility not only to myself and my family, but to my community. So that book kind of lit the spark, so to speak. I, that was around 1990 or so, 91. And from that point on, I just, I built on that, and I started reading more and reading more and reading more. When I got to prison, I had already been to college. Okay. So it's not like I didn't have a GED already. I, I was already educated, so I was beyond that first step. So I took the second step of taking college classes. I became a paralegal while I was inside, uh, and I, I became the uh, leader of a lot of different organizations trying to help the, you know, the men better themselves. So that, that was my journey, and it just kept going until where I am now. One, one of the saddest things for me is, is when I've been involved in prison ministries in certain prisons in the United States, um, to see a prisoner return, mm -hmm. to see them defeated, um, to realize that they weren't given skills to help them when they were released. Can you, can you talk about that a bit? That was one of my main uh, pet peeves when I was inside, that the Department of Corrections didn't provide actual life skills. They taught classes like custodial maintenance, uh, groundskeeping, and just general manual labor stuff, and very little to mm -hmm. deal with the person's you know, character. And that, that was always frustrating to me. So the guys that I knew in the organization we ran, we always held uh, enrichment classes in mm -hmm. through the organization. We would bring in people from the outside to sponsor programs for the men, mm -hmm. to show them there's a better way, to show them patience, to show them uh, empathy. and one thing about being human, if nothing else, humans are creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. So the longer you do a thing, the more you get used to doing it. So we try to catch them early on and get them in the habit of doing the things that will make them better citizens. Yes. You know, teach them how to be patient. Teach them how to be caring for the next guy. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about being in prison, you don't always, nobody always shines, hold that mirror up and let you mm -hmm. look in the mirror and call you on what you're doing wrong. And, mm -hmm. and I always get a story of, you know, when you first go to, when you first get arrested, you have the right to remain silent so you don't talk about your case. Mm -hmm. When you go to county jail, the, your attorney tell you, don't talk to your, your bunk mates. Mm -hmm. They may testify against you. After you get convicted, you go to prison. You don't talk about your case on the prison yard. So 15, 20, 30, 40 years go by, you've never talked about your case. Mm -hmm. So you haven't come to terms with what happened. You, you haven't given any thought about what happened with the victim. You haven't learned the empathy. You haven't developed the responsibility necessary to take responsibility for your crime. And so we always try to impart to those on the inside to do a lot of internal reflection, to talk to other people about your case. I mean, the facts of your case is never going to change. Mm -hmm. So you might as well just take a deep gulp, swallow them, and, and move forward because that's what the parole board is looking for. Have you taken that, you know, mm -hmm. th that deep gulp and say, yeah, I did it, I accept responsibility, and this mm -hmm. is where I am now. I, I like what you're saying. Um, helping those who are incarcerated to talk about what happened, yeah. um, their responsibility in it, talking with fellow inmates. I mean, when, when you talk about that and you listen to each other, yeah, they, they can challenge one another. Absolutely. And I, by the way, I've seen that. Yes. I've seen that. In, I've seen that in prison, yes. where, where fellow inmates, they're they're very quick and easy to call someone to the carpet. Yes, sir. I'm sure you've witnessed it. Uh, yeah, I've done it and witnessed it many times. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Well, we're going to take a break now, Ronald. Okay. And uh, we're, when we come back from our break, we'll continue our discussion, and um, want to probably go in a direction a bit about restorative justice a little bit more. I would like to talk about, you know second chances okay and then also we're going to talk a bit about um crossroads bible institute good okay good. so Great. thanks for listening and we'll be back in a few moments are you in prison do you know someone who is through cbi bible studies and encouragement from cbi instructors more than forty thousand people behind bars are learning the truth about salvation through christ and are developing deeper relationships with god for an enrollment form please visit us online at cbi.fm. Welcome back to this episode of Crossroad Connection. We have Ronald Simpson Bay with us from Just Leadership USA. 
And we want to go into the direction now of talking about second chances, and especially um, this wonderful term that is so rich for us as Christians that is the term redemption. And Ronald, let's talk about second chances. Just Leadership USA is encouraging second chances through the advocating. We, we talk to legislators and we talk to uh, communities, organizations, churches, pastors, and we advocate for them to consider, you know, if they were in that position, what, how would they feel? Would mm -hmm. they want a second chance? You know, one thing, when you're in the position of wanting a second chance, you have a different, you look at it through a different lens. And so we, we advocate just for people to take a look at what it means to be human. And at what point has punishment reached its, its term? Point. When is enough enough? Well, you know, part of the process of redemption um, is turning from your sin, mm -hmm. is turning from the wrong and mm -hmm. going the other direction. And for us as Christians, you know, we, we, we get our grace. Mm -hmm. we, we, redemption comes to us through Jesus Christ. Okay. And, and he helps us see our sin, but he also helps us to turn the other direction, to, to walk away from what we were doing. Um, how, how do you see um, people helping inmates turn and go the other direction? What, what, do you have any advice there? And I know in the Bible it talks about Jesus said, I was in prison and you visited me. Okay. You know, you should, I think that we should take an active interest as citizens to reach out to those who are incarcerated, not necessarily family members. I always encourage people to reach out to a stranger and communicate with them. Just develop a, a working relationship. Let them know that they are a part of our community, that they are a part of human society, and that they, should, they will be returning at some point. And the citizen, by doing that, could help impart to the incarcerated person the attributes and the principles that make them good citizens. I, I call it co-mentorship. Mm -hmm because the, the, the citizen can learn as much as the incarcerated person about redemption and second chances and the incarcerated person can learn about empathy and mm -hmm. what have you. So it, it's a give and take situation. Well, you know, Crossroads Bible Institute, um, our ministry is a ministry that gets lessons into inmates' hands. Okay. We, have, uh, we have three tiers. We have tier one, tier two, tier three. Mm -hmm. Uh, tier one is introductory material into what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ and what the Bible is about. And it's, yeah, introductory material, like I would say a one-on-one -on -one course. Mm -hmm. Tier two is a bit more in-depth, uh, going into what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then tier three is more college-level material. Okay. But what we do is, is we pair up students with instructors. And so an instructor grades a lesson and then the instructor writes a letter of encouragement to the person that's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And what we do in our Tier 2 is we now have a Tier 2 uh, segment that is about life skills. So Crossroad Bible Institute is about trying to develop relationships and having these relationships through letters be about Jesus Christ, His grace and redemption and turning from sin and going the other direction. We want those who participate in our material to know who God is, okay. to know that God gave His Son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and that through His grace there is rebirth, there is renewal, there is second chances, there is hope. Um, and that's our, our material is all aimed in that direction, mm -hmm. trying to give those who are incarcerated hope mm -hmm that there is a future for them. And so th that's what we're trying to do. Great. Hey, that's, a, that's a noble cause. Okay. Um, we have a lot of people that listen to us that are crossroad instructors. Okay. And I guess I want to ask a, a few questions of you about um, if you were receiving a letter in prison, especially from an instructor of Crossroad Bible Institute, as an inmate, what, what does an inmate want to hear? from someone who's writing a letter of encouragement? They, they want to hear that, you know, that someone cares about them. Okay. You know, we, one thing about we as human, we, you know, we are social, social beings. Mm -hmm. And so they want to feel they're being included into the social fabric of society. They don't want to feel like they're ostracized or they're otherized or mm -hmm. any other isms that we put people in these boxes. They want to feel 
they're as connected to the community as the community is connected to itself. Okay. Well, that is great advice. Um, yeah, to let them know that they matter. Yeah, to let absolutely. them know that they that let them know they are a human. I you, you use that word dehumanize. Yes, sir. Um, that has been my experience often going into prison. The dehumanization is 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 overwhelming. Overwhelming. And through a letter, um, an instructor can encourage someone that, hey, you are a human. You yeah. matter. You Absolutely. matter to God. You matter to me. And give that encouragement through the letter. And the thing about a letter, the, the letter to me is more valuable than the spoken word because the person can pick it back up at a later date and reread it again. It's like reading any book, literature, or religious text. You, you get a different message every time you read it because you, you've, you've gained a new level of understanding from the first time you read it. You've matured, matured to some degree. And so when you go back and read it again, mm -hmm. you pick that letter up and say, wow, you, know, you get a, a, new, a renewed sense of hope. And what's interesting, I, what I've discovered is many times the letters that um, our instructors write, not only is that person that's incarcerated reading the letter, but so also is the cellmate. Yeah, they share them. Um, I've also known inmates that uh, send their letters to their family members. Hey, you need to read what was written to me. Yeah. And so it, it, it spreads. A absolutely spreads. And you, oftentimes you see it'll uh, it, 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 it cause them to try to mend broken relationships because they go into that self-reflective mode and man, I, I need to make some things right in my life. So they'll reach out to people who they've hired their family, friends, loved ones, whomever, and start repairing mm -hmm. those relationships, which is all part of that social fabric I talked about a minute ago. Well, I know people that are listening to us, they might want to dig in a little bit more and discover what Just Leadership USA is. And so is there a way for them to get more information about Just Leadership USA? Yes, uh, we have a website, www.justleadershipusa dot com and you can go there there's there's a there's a lot of information on there about what we do and what we seek to do uh glenn martin uh we have facebook pages as well so you can go on facebook or you can go on just leadership website and get a lot of information ronald what's the future for you Let's oh man i i like to i like to coin a term from a song i heard back in the 80s my future's so bright i got to wear shades there's a lot <laughs> 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 There's a lot of things going on in my life, uh, positive things. I've become somewhat of a nationally recognized speaker. I do a lot of speaking events around the country dealing with cutting the prison population in half. Uh, this Friday I'm in St. Louis having a discussion at a conference about decarceration, and it's, it's a huge event. I was in D.C. a couple of, about a month ago at the uh, Bipartisan Justice Summit where they had both parties of the House and Congress there trying to talk about decarceration. So it's like it, this work is a lot of to be done in this work. So I have no shortage of job opportunities as far as doing social justice work. So I hear you saying the future is bright. Yes, there sir. is uh, many opportunities for you. Yes, sir. What was it like to be speaking to that bipartisan uh, group in Washington? Oh, that was that was amazing. And what was more amazing, I had got invited to a, a closed door session to speak with them, uh, to educate them about you know the, the collateral consequences of incarceration. So that was even better because a lot of them are looking for, you know, strategies and talking points mm -hmm. if they're going to support the decarceration movement. What questions were they asking? Did uh, they, they <laughs> ask, what, I'm, I'm curious, what questions <laughs> those who are serving our nation are asking? Well, I don't know if I can, you know, go into that much okay. because, you know, they, they told us, we sh you know, they didn't want to really discuss it okay. publicly. Okay. And, but it was... Um, it was interesting. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that they, they were talking with you, that you spoke with them. Yes. And uh, that's where it's going to begin. It's going to begin with our legislators. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're going to have to begin to change, you know, how we sentence yeah. and how our prison systems are run. You know, you know, part of that process, and you talk about change, and I think, you know, yes, it's going to start with the legislator, but I think that the grassroots, the citizens, is mm -hmm. where it's going to start. Because we have to have heart change in the community. Mm -hmm. Because you can change laws tomorrow. If we haven't had the heart change in the community, it's not going to mount to a hill of beans because it won't be very effective. But once the people, the community gets involved in this process mm -hmm. and they find out who's actually in prison, because there's this stigma, there's this myth of who's actually in prison. Everybody see these horrible examples of 
people that have done horrible crimes, you know, the Charles Mansons mm -hmm. and the people that, you know, these national figures who've done horrible crimes. And every, all the other two million prisoners get painted with the same brush. But when you go in, you've been in prison before, mm -hmm. and you meet the men like, wow, these are, this guy could be my neighbor. This guy could be my, you know, my, my clerk at the store. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't have any problem with it because now you've seen, you th through the interaction, through the, those relationships, you see who's actually in prison. And I think once the community gets, you know, sight of that, you know, experience mm -hmm. that for themselves, they like, they have that heart change necessary for this reform that we seek. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Um, when I talk to people about um, those who are incarcerated, and I hear them uh, say, you know, throw the key away, long yeah. sentences, you know, all of that. Um, I often challenge them. I, I look at them and I say, do you realize that Joseph was <laughs> incarcerated? Yeah. You, you know, this biblical figure, yeah. uh, this person that uh, became a leader Me. in Egypt, yeah. helped save, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people from starvation. Yeah. Um, I, I always look at them and I say, you know, he was incarcerated. Yeah. And... Um, Look what happened with his life. And Absolutely. he said to his family, for such a time as this, yeah. God used all of this to put me here. Absolutely. I mean, look, look at the story of Jesus. He, he rebelled against Roman law. Mm -hmm. and he, I, mean, he would, I mean, today he would have been in prison for what he did. Because <laughs> 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 he, he, you know, he went against the laws of you know, the Roman law at the time. So it's like hmm. all our reformers and you know, leaders have come from, you know, adverse situations mm -hmm. because they understand the plight of the people. And so we should not be afraid of those who have been incarcerated. If we treat them with human dignity while they're inside, if we return mm -hmm. the humanity back to being human instead of just lock them up, throwing mm -hmm. away the key, all these tough on crime slogans that people mm -hmm. sling around so freely, then we can return back to, you know, being able to love one another. Amen. That's my hope. Amen. Well, Ronald, this has been a joy. Our, our time has quickly passed, quickly. And, uh, but it's been a joy talking with you. I pray blessings for you with uh, Just Leadership USA. Thank you. Uh, I pray that uh, you have to keep your sunglasses on, okay? <laughs> That's yeah. okay. I, I pray that God keeps providing opportunities for you to speak. Thank so you. So thanks for being with us Thanks today. for having me. Okay. Bless you. And for all those who are listening today, thanks for listening to this episode of Crossroad Connection. And we look forward to when you tune in with us again. God's blessings. <laughs>